Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are now commencing hearing number 12 of the 187th period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. And it is entitled Labor Rights of, Inform sec of Informal Sector Workers in the Americas. And it was requested by WEIGO and Solidarity Center. My name is Margaret May McCauley. I'm president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights and the Rapporteur for People of African Descent and Against Racism and for the rights of older persons. I am joined in this panel by the first vice president and rapporteur for children and adolescents' rights and for indigenous peoples. Um, co that is co uh, Commissioner, first vice president, Esmeralda Aruesamina de Troitino. And I'm also joined by the rapporteur for women and for memory, truth, and justice, Commissioner Julissa Mantilla. And also, we are to be joined by the Rapporteur for Human Mobility and for Human Rights Defenders, Commissioner Joel Hernandez. And here present with us, and very important member as well of this hearing, is the Special Rapporteur for Economic, Social, Cultural, and Environmental Rights, Soledad Gracia Munoz, and her lots of her team, if not all of them. Um, so I give, uh, and of course, we have present the uh, civil society who, uh, who I mentioned above. So I welcome you all to this uh, 12th hearing of our period of sessions. Well, let me mention how the time has been distributed and please keep your eye on the clock when speaking so that you will keep within the allotted time. Thank you. Civil society will have 25 minutes. And then the Inter-American Commission panel will also have 25 minutes. And then civil society will have an additional 22 minutes to make further comments or reply. And then I will close the, the hearing after that for three minutes or less. I, for those who are online, I think I have said what they, oh, for those who are online, I have, um, who might wish to know something about the background. I, I'll, I'll just read to you the background so you can have the background, those who are witnessing this online. According to the Inter International Labor Law Organization, I ILO, informal employment includes all paid work, which is not registered, regulated, or protected by legal or regulatory frameworks, so that workers in informal employment do not have secure employment contracts, employment benefits, social protection, or worker representation, among others. In its recommendation 204, the ILO states that informal work can be observed in all sectors of the economy. And in this hearing, we will discuss the case of work on digital platforms and the case on, of informal recycling workers. These, these are two different occupations which break with the classic model of work and therefore face challenges for workers in these occupations to be recognized as such. As a result, they are not guaranteed the rights derived from their work and suffer from labor precariousness. As established by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, the right to work implies the right to perform a work activity under dignified and fair conditions and to receive in return for their work a remuneration which allows them to enjoy a decent standard of living which enables workers to provide for their families with better health, housing, and education conditions. So this is what we are here to hear about um, this afternoon. So welcome again, everyone.
and I now give the floor to civil society. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Madam President. We would like to uh, respectfully request if you can add five more minutes to the first block and subtract them for the, from the final part. We would really appreciate that. that. That is fine. It means that you have organized yourself very well. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very fine. much. So 30, it, 30 minutes for the first. Yeah, thank you. In this thematic hearing, we will address the issue of uh, work precariousness, the lack of regulation uh, of, of protections to two persons who are currently informal workers. First, we will uh, listen to the uh, Confederación Internacional de las Américas, CSA, the Federación del Transporte, ITF, and ILO Network that along with the president of UNIDAD will address the situation of work in digital platforms. Afterwards, the Red Latinoamericana de Recicladores and Mujeres en Empleo Informal will present the human rights situation of persons who work in recycling. Even though work uh, even they are very different activities. They both challenge the traditional modes of employment and pose challenges for uh, their workers to be recognized as actual workers, even though the uh, declaration, the American Declaration provides for uh, the rights of workers and the fact that the Protocol of San Salvador uh, enshrines the rights of uh, union rights and social security, we will show how in Latin America these rights are not respected nor warranted when we're talking about workers of digital platforms and recycling. And even though the work in digital platforms is appearing with the same characteristics and intensity throughout the world, the member states of the OAS in Latin America are not respecting nor promoting the rights to labor association and social security of workers in the service of digital platforms, in particular because of a lack of acknowledgement or even hiding the working relationship. Their lack of classification leads to violations of their, print, of their fundamental rights, their conditions for work, and they provide obstacles for the exercise of their union freedoms. The arrival of digital platforms at the region happened many years ago. It's not a recent phenomenon that, that, that has changed and is representative of the economies in the region. And even though there are no official data on the real dimension of platform work in Latin America, it is estimated that millions are part of it. Platform, uh, platform uh, digital platform workers are, work in conditions of uh, lack of formality and uh, worker um, labor precariousness. During the pandemic, we were considered essentials and we played a key role in uh, helping the transportation of health uh, workers, food and supplies. But our work was not valued and our rights were not insured. We have increased our participation in digital platforms with the rise of structural unemployment in our countries, and that allowed platforms to benefit from our vulnerability. In Latin America, over 9% of workers have provided services through platforms. Work on digital platforms is a source of an alternative source of income, but many of us, in particular in the transportation of passengers and delivery, for many of us, that's our main source of employment. And even though there's no accurate data on the participation of women, it is estimated that we don't we don't work as much on digital platforms as in other jobs, but it's a bit more when we're talking about service or care platforms. Women who work in delivery and transportation platforms face more challenges in terms of uh, working conditions, health, infections due to our long days driving. We don't have a sanitary uh, protection measures we face sexual harassment from the users of the applications. Almost 30% of women who work in delivery apps or transportation apps have suffered harassment. 
even sexual harassment by our customers or the businesses we work with. We are exposed to our uh, risk, to risks to our life and integrity. Most of us have higher uh, education, and many of us uh, even uh, have postgraduate degrees. And we hope platform work would just be temporary for us. Less than half of us work for only one platform. And most of us are registered in two or more platforms or provide services for many of them. Platforms depend or rely on migrant uh, workers of color and half their workers are migrants and in irregular migrants, that is. And that is taking advantage of these platforms by these platforms. Uh, to abuse workers. And even though the low barriers in accessing these uh, jobs uh, appear as uh, benefits, the truth is that the business model uh, perpetuates our precariousness. Our working conditions are very precarious. The remuneration is low. There's high discrimination. There's harassment. We don't have social security. We don't have adequate warranties, health or work safety, security for the um, work we do in public spaces. Many, uh, we are exposed to uh, the possibility of accidents on the road. Many of us have suffered some sort of labor accident, and most of us did not receive adequate medical attention. We also face risks related to uh, climate issues, pollution, insecurity, and even theft while, at, while we are at work. We face long and intense uh, work days. We work over five days a week for about 10 hours every day. During these days, delivery persons stay on the streets. That's where we eat. That's where we weigh the products, the deliveries, and we care for our children as we do that. The time the uh, we are available for these platforms waiting for a product is not paid to us, even though they tell us we have a possibility to choose our uh, working uh, our working times and work at several applications at the same times because they say that we are entrepreneurs. The truth is that we are providing services that are controlled by the applications. And our boss is the algorithm. This so-called freedom is restricted with perverse incentives and sanctions and even blockages decided by the platforms. The algorithm awards and punishes our autonomy and controls our work. These platforms control the entire business. They own the customers, the image, and they are the ones who decide uh, how much we are paid and when. We have tried to unionize, and even though several digital platforms have promoted false unions, or mobilizations of non-unionized persons to uh, deceive the public opinion to oppose a real change. In the region, there are over 15 organizations of workers of digital platforms in seven countries, and many others are on the way, but we still have not been uh, recognized in our right to collective bargaining. And whenever we tried to exert our right to strike, we were blocked out of the applications. Digitalization and automatization have strengthened classist and racial biases. And instead of moving us forward, they have deteriorated our life conditions and our work. Thank you very much. So far, there are there has been no pronouncement defining the nature of the work in digital platforms or the rights entitled to their workers. The European Union in 2021 launched a proposal to be adopted by the uh, European platform aiming at ensuring the determination of persons working for digital platforms. And yesterday they held a debate to pass it. 
while the Mercosur Parliament has just passed the working plan to study the situation of workers of digital platforms real, um, and the Council of the ILO decided to draft a new instrument or recommendation on uh, decent labor in digital platforms that will be debated after its annual conference in 2025. Now, out of the analysis of the legal decisions adopted in Latin America on work in digital platforms, we have identified corporative strategies to hide the reality of the labor relations, for example, stipulating indemnization or compensation clauses in favor of the employer, uh, saying that there are three parts in and that the platform is just a middleman. They even have clauses that uh, provide for extrajudicial arbitrations so that the court so that the cases won't go to court nine countries already have rulings about these cases 47 percent of them recognize the existence of a labor contract 26 percent of them declared them autonomous workers and the rest have pronounced on the right to unionize there's no legal ruling uh, from in any of our countries in in uh, the labor uh, courts. We have also identified over 25 bills in countries in our region. 45% of these are for, uh, are trying to recognize a working contract. 22 of them want to define its autonomous independent work. 13% of them say that it's a third category. They try to create a new intermediate modality acknowledging the work but only with some specific rights that can be applied to this new modality now this has led to intense debate in our countries only Ch in chile have they passed a bill that establishes that these workers will be can either, either be dependent or independent without determining the nature of their work and recognizing minimum rights that can be applied to work in platforms. The Directorate for Labor in Chile recognizes its possibility to establish um, indications of actual work, and that led to several demands from the, these companies. Justice has ruled in favor of the Directorate. In Uruguay, in August last year, the government presented a bill that uh, wants to regulate the work uh, in digital platforms that is very similar to the one in Chile. The bill was presented at the General Assembly in September last year, but has not been discussed yet. In Mexico, the federal government has, pre has been preparing a bill to recognize the work relation in digital platforms that um, the opposition tried to object, but it was postponed, postponed because uh, they couldn't achieve on an actual model for social security. In Colombia, they are trying to include a new bill on the work in digital platforms that recognizes its work and that there is a working relationship. The bill was filed because the opposition did not allow for any type of debate, but the national government has said that it will present it once again. In our region, Along with the, um, there's uh, this uh, follows the uh, recommendation number 198 of the ILO, and that is very useful to consider. It is uh, there is a legal uh, relation, working relation. The truth is that the uh, our region has a positivist tradition. There's no political will in many of our governments. There's a low rate of unionization, and there is uh, no. Uh, support for collective bargaining. So it's very difficult to protect these workers, even though uh, the the ju justice has tried to, justice systems have tried to protect that there is a legal relation. The truth is, the truth is that that is not enough to uh, for the for justice, for the judiciary to be a solution. The legislative seems not to be a solution either because there's lobbying from the platform. So there hasn't been progress in the passing of laws and the only existing law in a region has not shown to be efficient. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Federico Parra. And together with the Latin American Network uh, 
recyclers of the Caribbean, we would like to thank you for this space to talk about the reality of recyclers in our region. Good morning, my name is Jenny Gonzalez. I'm a recycler and I've been a recycler for 33 years and also a delegate. Recyclers are men and women of all ages. We earn our livelihood by recycling metals, paper, and wood in rubbish. We work in the municipalities across Latin America. We come from the most poor or the poorest sector in society. And we have suffered different types of poverty. According to the ILO, ILO there are over 20 million um, recyclers. In Latin America, according to the IDB, there are over 4 million recyclers. Out of them, 300,000 are organized under the Latin American network of recyclers. The work of recyclers is very important for society, especially in terms of the environment. Also, this system provides raw materials for the industry. And also, these recyclers are suppliers of a public service. They reduce uh, the stress and um, garbage management systems. We go together with an organization, develop a calculator to measure the contributions of the recyclers network. These calculators show that in Argentina in 2019, um, millions of tons of um, gases uh, were avoided thanks to the work of the recyclers. The Latin American network of recyclers gathers over 300,000 recyclers. 56% of them are women and 44 are men. And also, for example, in Panama, 2.5% of the members are migrants. And we have information in Latin America that shows us that um, also foreign persons contribute to this work. Hello, my name is Tania Espinosa. I am also a member of WIGO. I would like to tell this commission that since 2007, we have documented the uh, violations of rights of recyclers, especially in countries in Latin America. The Special Rapporteur for Economic, Social, Cultural, and Environmental Rights has visited some of these countries. And the ISIHR has mentioned these violations in previous reports. We see that there are some violations that appear in several countries, such as the lack of social protection, stigmatization of the work of recycling, and the lack of recognition of recycling as a work, um, and prohibition to access to landfills, for example, restrictions to circulate in the city, and other types of restrictions to infrastructure and also um, the recyclers are expelled and there is a lack of governance in workplaces. They are persecuted and they suffer the effects of organized crime. They lack any type of access to unions or other organizations. Threats to use incineration as a garbage management system there could be an alternative disproportionate use of force by authorities against our recyclers, public policies that create nominal inclusion or symbolic inclusion, but lead to the exclusion of recyclers, or there is a lack of integration of recyclers in the supply chains. Also, we see that there are laws of circular economy that do not guarantee access to materials for recyclers. 
also we see a lack of law of laws in terms of packaging in order to guarantee the recovery of the materials. Also big companies that benefit from the materials recycled by the recyclers, um, and these companies benefited more than recyclers. So what we see is there is a lack of data regarding the number of recyclers that exist. They are not included in census. Now I would like to present about three essential aspects regarding the rights of recyclers, the right to work, the right to a dignified life, and the right uh, of guaranteeing human rights by companies. Regarding the right to work, the Inter-American Court has talked about the right to work, which is established in Article 6 of the Convention. And also Article 14 of the American Declaration establishes that all persons have the right to work in, in digni and dignified conditions. And this is also present in Article 6, 7, and 8 of the San Salvador Protocol. The protocol, however, the Inter-American Court or the Commission have not said that only those who work in the informal market are protected by these rights. This right is for everyone. So recommendation 204 of the ILO on the transition of from the informal sector to the formal sector indicates that a state should guarantee uh, the measures so that everyone who is employed in the formal economy has a guarantee to access rights. Also, in its general comment 18, uh, the ESER committee talks that the right to work is for all types of work and states should not interfere in that work or in that right. Therefore, every time that the states through actions or omissions threaten access to garbage by recyclers, they are not complying with their obligation to respect the right to work. The lack of compliance with the obligation uh, to guarantee the right to work also imply the lack of adequate measures to protect recyclers. This also has to do with preventing recyclers from accessing materials. Some companies are in charge of management, uh, waste management, and they do not guarantee access to the materials or to the waste uh, for recyclers. Sometimes the states are employers, uh, such as in the case of the city of Mexico, and recyclers are being exploited. They are not considered workers. And this is a violation of Article 1.1 and Article 24 of the American Convention because there is a lack of equality before the law. Therefore, it is fundamental that we guarantee the right to work of recyclers who work in the informal sector. Regarding the right to a dignified life, the jurisprudence of the court has established that the right to life that is included in Article 4 of the American Convention includes the right to a dignified life. Um, and also, it's important to indicate that the state should guarantee the right to a healthy environment, which is related to life and to the health of the communities. And it has been established in Advisory Opinion 23. Therefore, any action or omission of this a right is an omission by the government. Serious pollution can lead to diseases, disabilities. The protocol of San Salvador in its article 11 says that every person has the right to have basic services. And this is the framework of work of recyclers. According to a report on sustainable development of the ILO, recyclers recover many recyclable materials. Although in many cases, these persons live in poverty. States are aware of the marginalization situation of um, recyclers. So actions or omissions by the government to take away the work and the livelihoods of recyclers implies a violation of the right to dignify life. The state should be prevented that risk. Also, the work of recyclers has important social impacts in cities so that access to dignified lives is enabled for many communities. Recyclers 
provide an environmental service that should be highlighted and therefore they should have access to uh, security, safety and health conditions of work. Recyclers have no protection equipment. They are exposed to different toxins and um, pollution and also the presence of chemical substances in nanomaterials is increasing. Um, the lack of recognition by the states leads to um, the existence of very low and very poor work conditions for recyclers. Also, states know that since they are not guaranteeing the right work conditions, recyclers are facing a risk to their dignified life. And since they do nothing to prevent that risk, they are also violating the right to life and the right to a healthy environment of the recyclers. Also, it is urgent that recyclers are guaranteed the right to social protection, at least to guarantee health protection and a subsidy if there is a professional disease or a work accident. And also women should be protected during pregnancy. And these benefits that are established in the San Salvador protocol should be extended to people working in the informal sector. If this is also a violation of the right to dignify life as established in the case of the mosquito divers against Honduras. Uh, in order to guarantee the life to uh, the right to work uh, and to guarantee the is necessary to guarantee the right to dignified life. So a state should guarantee the rights of workers in order to guarantee the right to a dignified life. Regarding companies and human rights, uh, states have the obligation to protect workers. And for that, states should adopt measures so that companies have policies that protect human rights, due diligence processes, and reparation for the violations of rights that they have committed, especially when there are violations against persons that are in a situation of poverty or in a situation of vulnerability. This is the case of recyclers. This is also included in the guideline principles on businesses and human rights of the United Nations. When Recyclers are not considered companies um, usually contribute to the violation of the right to work of recyclers. Instead of protecting this, they create a negative impact on the communities where recyclers live. According to jurisprudence of the court, companies and transnational companies should respond to this when they benefit from activities from national companies. If they could hire national companies that violate rights. States, when they do not regulate the work of recyclers, and since they do not regulate the actions of companies, are, vulnerable, are violating the rights of recyclers. When the state is not overseeing the work of companies, is also a violating international standards. Therefore, it is necessary that companies comply with human rights and states supervise and oversee that there are no abuses against recyclers. It is also important to highlight that we are not talking about state behaviors related to the progress uh, on economic, social, cultural, environmental rights. We are demanding immediate action by the states. The petition will be done presented in the next um participation thanks thank you <clears throat> thank you very much i i now um uh invite the uh, members of the uh, commission to do their intervention and i i call upon um, hmm. I think I have to just take the order as it is put down. The first vice president, um, <laughs> Esmeralda de Trotino, Arasamela de Trotino, please, could you interrupt? Bueno, gracias, 
Gracias, Presidenta. Ahora a mí me hubiera gustado que le diera la palabra a... Thanks, Madam President. I think that it would be great that you uh, would have given the floor to the special rapporteur for economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights because she's the star so. yes. at this hearing. So. Yes. But it's okay, don't worry. I want to thank all of you, to thank all the organizations uh, for the information that you have provided us with, for your work. This is a type of work that requires a lot of effort because this issue is not considered a problem, is not studied. And having the possibility of receiving information that is very harsh and very difficult to process because it is about the need that we have to recognize that in spite of the value of this work of recycling, no one recognizes it as such. In spite of the current circumstances, in spite of the climate crisis, in spite of what we are experiencing in all countries around the world, we ask ourselves, what is happening? And we know for sure that we are destroying the planet. And this is something that I would like to say to recyclers. I recognize you for your work. And when it comes to digital and online platforms, I believe that they also may um, contribute a lot. I must confess, when we talk about online platforms, I never thought of who is behind those platforms. The guy that delivers the food I'm not calling because the company already is hiring someone who is going to deliver my food, for example. So we need to have these discussions in the public sphere, in the legal sphere, when we talk about human rights, when we talk about human dignity, I think that's very, very important. That's paramount. Thank you for all the information. I know that uh, the Office of the Special Rapporteur has made great efforts in very specific areas. And one of them is companies or businesses and human rights. And this is an area that we should explore. And many of these companies are just ignoring in order not to assume responsibility for what they should do. So the only comment that I have, or the only request that I have is that we should have this information in writing so that the Office of the Special <coughs> Rapporteur and the Commission as a whole are more aware of this issue and are able to prioritize this issue. We need to reinforce and to reaffirm principles, concepts, and that's necessary. And this is to demand rights. This is not to guarantee the progress of economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights. To have a dignified life, we need to guarantee these rights, these fundamental rights. So I just want to congratulate you for this. Thank you. Um, thank you so, so very much for that. I now um, invite um, a Commissioner uh, Ho 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 Joel Hernandez to intervene. 
Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Creo que estamos... Thank you very much, Madam President. I think that we are all uh, waiting for the intervention of the Special Rapporteur Soledad Garcia Muñoz, but thank you very much. Thank you, civil society organizations, for having requested the, this hearing. And I'm sure that with Soledad's support, as Commissioner Rosemena said, uh, thanks to this hearing, you've brought to our attention, a group of workers who are invisibilized right now, but who are part of our everyday lives. The world we live in, just having a cell phone uh, on your hand, it's part of our modern life, right? Especially post pandemic. Uh, in our post-pandemic life, we can access many services through digital platforms. And unfortunately, and that is the big contribution you make, but we don't know much about the working conditions of those uh, who provide these services. It has been very interesting to learn about the precarious situation you're in and how this precariousness is perversely the comparative advantage because as long as labor is cheap and there are no uh, fair wages, not even minimum wages, wages, that is how there's a benefit uh, from the for the service. But of course, there this must be put to a halt so that we can um, return the rights these persons have been denied. I think this has been very enlightening, learning about the efforts that are being made at a multilateral level and also at a national level. I wasn't aware of this, but I've duly noted the difference of the conference of the ILO of um, drafting an international instrument in 2025. I think that's a step ahead and it's very important. I'm I'm sure it wasn't easy at all because these are lengthy processes, but it's welcome because once there's an international instrument from the ILO, the next step will be demanding states to undersign that instrument and the ILO conventions have a very strong legal, legal force in countries so it's a gra it's gradual but it's a major step I was it was also very interesting to listen to Mary Laura Perdomo and her analysis of the different efforts uh, in national congresses to regulate these activities, the future uh, convention and the national legislation will complement each other. I believe, and this is what came to my mind while I was listening to you, I do believe that the commission needs to make its contribution in developing inter-American standards to protect uh, digital platform workers and of course, uh, recyclers as well. So we will be uh, paying attention to the first case that arrives at our system because we know that it will be an exemplary case that will also assist to the progressive development of uh, international human rights law. I would like to respectfully greet Jenny Gonzalez. Thank you so much, Jenny, for being here for bringing this important work you're doing as you've gone over about the impact of your work of recyclers work and then for the second round i will leave a couple of uh, uh questions that i was thinking of um those persons who are vulnerable and I mean, in particular, migrants who are usually employed, quote unquote, by 
these digital platforms. I have this weakness, right? I always get the need to talk to the uh, person who's driving the transportation wherever I, wherever I am. And they are usually migrants who found in transportation a way to make ends meet. And there were many questions around the situation of their human rights. So I would like to learn more about migrants in uh, the work being done in digital platforms. But when it comes to recycling, I can think of other groups of special attention. I mean, children and adolescents who are uh, usually in that kind of work, but also older persons who Uh, since they don't have as many possibilities to work, they find another way to make a living. So I would like to um, hear what you think about these vulnerable groups. And that will be all, Madam President. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner Hernandez. Um, I, I now, um, there is a method in my madness. I now invite my sister, Commissioner Ulisa Mantia to intervene because I know everybody wants to hear you, Soledad, so they wouldn't be as long <laughs> as the normal it would be. So there we go, my sister, Ulisa. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Un Thank you, con... Madam President. I would like to greet fully uh, to greet you and the participants of this hearing, in particular the special rapporteur, because as my colleague said, she was the uh, drive for this uh, hearing. I won't say it's the most important one, but I think it is historic. So thank you very much, Soledad, and thank you for everyone participating, not just for being here, but because of the daily work you do with the persons you are representing. And you were wise enough, as we were saying on the practice session, of um, combining two spheres that seem disconnected, but the truth is that they share many circumstances when it comes to the lack of respect for their rights and these types of work that are invisibilized. And we're talking about the responsibility of businesses and human rights, but I would also like to make a, to, to make a call to users because this is about demand and supply. The, these uh, delivery workers exist because there's people demanding for this. So work regulation needs to acknowledge this situation. So I wanted to uh, remember, to remind us of uh, the uh, uh, advising opinion of uh, number 21, which says that the regulation of work in new technologies should follow the criteria of universability, universality, uh, considering that uh, there should be a warranty for dignified work. And it would seem that we need to remember once again that these are rights, right? The right to associate, to unionize. That's the first thing I wanted to say. And also I wanted to ask about the gender disaggregation. You were telling us about recyclers, which is a more general situation, but I would like to know if you have differentiated numbers because the situation is different, the impact is different. And in the case of recyclers, but also of workers of digital platforms, I really appreciate what you were saying about the rulings. Uh, we've taken notes about the, diff the ways in which the courts are interpreting the situation. So I think the commission has a very important role to play in gathering standards that can provide guidelines to national courts. So I would like to ask, if you have more information about the uh, ex officio investigations, the uh, reports that are filed, but also the investigations ex officio that take place at the ministries for, for labor. I think there was an investigation uh, in Colombia about um, the um, this delivery persons. So I would like to know about that. And finally, one reflection 
Of course, we went through a pandemic that is not really over and we got used to certain situations and many persons had to close their businesses. They had to leave their work and started to work with these <coughs> digital platforms. And we go back to that differentiated vision. What has been the impact of women? Um, what, how this pandemic beyond the right to health has had a major impact in labor rights because it would seem that they, um, that standards that took a lot of work and time to be consolidated, the right to strike, to unionize, to having an actual schedule of eight historic hours, everything seems to be loosened now. And we went back to what happened before. And we forgot about rights that were already part of the universe of human rights. So I would like to thank you once again, uh, I feel so much respect for the work you do. Thank you so much for being here because you represent Miriam, Jenny, you represent so many persons who are watching this hearing, feeling so hopeful. And thank you, Commissioner, because you uh, help us to keep on moving forward with this issue. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, my sister, Julissa. <coughs> I have a coughing fit. Um, I now invite the star of this matter because we thank you so much for bringing it forward. Soledad Garcia Munoz, who's a special rapporteur on economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights. Excuse my voice. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Madam President. Eh, realmente la, la estrella de, de, de esta audiencia es... um, in fact the star of this hearing are the workers and also the commission for opening the doors to them for redesca and for the commission it's important to show the importance of the right to work it should be at the center because decent work, dignified work, according to the UN and to the Inter-American system, is the door that people have to guarantee a dignified life for our families and for ourselves and to guarantee our human rights. I'm very happy that this hearing is happening. And this is the last hearing that I am promoting as a special rapporteur. And I would like to thank and to recognize the commission for its sensibility, for its openness to the issues that the Redesca has been promoting over the years. And I would like to thank also the recyclers and the organizations because they have re been requesting this hearing for many, many months and you organize yourselves to be here today thank you for preparing so well we also need to recognize all workers represented through these organizations these are millions and millions of persons according to the inter-american development bank in latin america over four million people work in the collection, transport of recyclable materials. And according to the ITB, the only urban wastes that are uh, recycled are those recovered by recyclers through informal systems. This data should make us wonder how cannot, why cannot we recognize that this work is so important for the environment and for people and for cities? Why is so precarious and why is ignored? We have been working in Mexico, in Panama, in Costa Rica. We have been witnessing the work of recyclers and I can assure you it is hard Recently, we visited Brazil. We listened to the testimonies of different workers 
of digital platforms. They talked about their difficult stories, about how difficult it is to work in the streets, driving, um, delivering products every day. And this is a situation that is uh, very clear in Latin America, the relationship between poverty and informal market. Also, what we see is that one out of two workers in the informal sector in Latin America also suffers lack of economic stability, lack of social protection, etc. The ILO indicates that informal workers have three or four times more possibilities of being in poverty and 70% of poverty is suffered by informal workers. This is worsened by the economic crisis that occurred after the COVID-19 pandemic. And I would like to uh, share some information with the commission and with those who participate at this hearing. It is important for a state to adopt sound measures to improve employment conditions in the region. Informal workers should be considered workers and their rights should be fully protected. Most of the workers of Latin America are in a precarious situation and that is a real human rights scandal. And I would like to encourage the commission so that from now on, after this hearing, the commission extends its commitment to promote the rights of informal workers in the region. On May the 1st, 2023, we issue a press release calling upon the recognition and protection of the rights of recyclers and informal workers in the region. At this hearing, each commissioner has important thematic rapporteurships. And in all those groups, there are always people who work as informal workers. I have three specific questions for the organizations. You can answer them now or later. Commissioner Julissa Mantilla talked about advisory opinion 27. Uh, which was requested by the commission. And I have two questions about the future of work. It would be great if you could talk about the limitations that exist in terms of union rights and what this means when it comes to the defense of your labor rights. Secondly, I would like to have more information about how companies benefit and what their responsibility is. And finally, since today with us, we have the country reporter for Mexico, Commissioner Esmeralda, and you talked about a specific situation in Mexico. I think that it would be very interesting if you can expand what happened with those uh, volunteers who are in fact workers and the closure of landfills that is happening in different countries of the region. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so very much, Soledad. Um, I, I would take a few seconds to just say that I am particularly interested in, like for, in, for instance, the recyclers, the older persons who are, have been and are still struggling in doing recycling work. What is their situation, particularly um, in this regard? Some countries have, in fact, put in a, a national insurance for any person who has not received a national insurance pension through the work, recognized work. So some countries are doing something, but it is important that we have not really paid attention to it because one has always looked at, at recyclers as independent workers. Uh, um, and so therefore, they're not within the taxation 
group of peoples and so on. But it is, it, you have opened our minds today and we have to work together to see what can be done um, in, in the, this regard. Uh, and also there are other groups of workers, perhaps one can examine like the grave diggers uh, uh, and so on in various countries and other groups or, or um, street sweepers and, and all that. I, I, I think there are lots of people, you open my imagination and it's, it's a good thing uh, to make us focused. So thank you very, very much. I now call upon you for your answers uh, and further comments. You have 17 minutes. Thank you. Bueno, gracias. Y primero vamos a hacer Thank you. nuestras uh, conclusiones. First of all, we are going to present our conclusions and petitions. And after that, we are going to answer the questions, if that's okay. You, you so, manage your time. <laughs> okay. Y yo voy a empezar y después uh, Jenny. I will uh, start. And then one of my colleagues, Jenny, will present some of the conclusions. The general rule for online platforms in Latin America and the Caribbean is the dehumanization, the lack of recognition of workers, the denial of their labor rights and the denial of their social rights. Um, online platforms in the Caribbean violate social rights. And also we see that the actions and omissions of the states of the region call for international organizations and human rights organizations to take action in the region. Although um, human rights standards protect all type of human rights, such as social security. Um, the states are not complying with their commitments. Um, there are no fair salaries. There are no equal opportunities of employment. Um, uh, there is no guarantee to the right to life and to health. And informal workers do not have access to a good economic condition or a status. As it was mentioned before, the Inter-American Court notes the work on digital platforms in its advisory opinion of 2021, and it considered that it's necessary to regulate this work in new technologies, taking into consideration the importance of labor rights in order to guarantee fair and decent working conditions. Also, emergence digital platforms imply new ways of work, new modes of work, and this poses new challenges to labor rights. And sometimes online platforms exclude labor rights for workers. This is stability or a minimum salary. And therefore, informal workers are prevented from accessing their labor rights. Therefore, we thank the commission for having allowed us to present this situation at this hearing and to present our conclusions and to present the following petitions. First, we need to have regional criteria to guide regulatory activity when it comes to work on online platforms and digital platforms. Or it could be regulatory frameworks to solve issues and doubts regarding the work with or in on online platforms. Also to urge states to prepare guidelines to build 
public policies that protect labor rights. Thirdly, to um, promote or to investigate jurisprudence in order to guarantee the protection of rights and to promote union organization. Fourth, to prepare a report on the rights of workers and digital platforms in order to make this phenomenon visible and to make the working conditions visible and also to draft urgent recommendations regarding the labor situation of this uh, group of workers. Fifth, we would like for the commission to visit the countries. And this is part of the discussions with the government. But it would be great for the commission to visit workers, organizations, and so that the rights of workers are made visible. The commission should request governments to draft legislation in this regard. And finally, we would like for the commission and the, and the office of the special rapporteur to provide support and we celebrate uh, the findings of the annual report. We hope that you continue to support us to promote uh, human rights in the region. Thank you. Now I would like to give the floor to Jenny. These are our petitions to defend us recyclers. When it comes to the closure of landfills across the region without any other alternatives for recyclers, we recyclers request respectfully to the IACHR to issue precautionary measures to protect the livelihoods of us, the recyclers, who depend on the landfills that are to be closed. This would prevent an irreparable harm to our right to a dignified life. Also, we request the ICHR to call up on the state so that they design a consultation protocol that is monitored by the state and should be implemented by the government, by the businesses that are participating in the closure of the landfills so that recyclers are guaranteed mechanisms of labor reintegration formulated with the participation of recyclers and the participation of recycler organizations. When it comes to exploitation and the lack of remuneration for our work, although it is a public service, we would like for the IACHR to request information from the states so that, and also for the IACHR to pronounce and call up on the states so that the states recognize as recyclers, as workers. Also, we would like for the states to take measures to guarantee the right to work, fair and decent work conditions and union rights. When it comes to the situation of displacement without any alternatives of recyclers because of the privatization of the management and access to waste and the lack of responsibility by companies and businesses when it comes to the role and rights of recyclers, we would like for the IACHR to request states to provide information on how they are complying with the standards and businesses and human rights. And also we would like the IACHR to pronounce and call upon states to comply with those standards on businesses and human rights, especially when it comes to uh, the fact that a state should uh, have the obligation of conducting impact or social impact studies to know the negative impact of these projects on the lives of recyclers. And when it comes to the lack of access to social protection for recyclers, the IACHR would like for uh, the, we would like for the IACHR to prepare or develop minimum standards regarding the guarantee to the right to social protection, whether the uh, jobs are formal or informal. And also we would like 
uh, for the ISHR to call upon states to reduce barriers against um, social security. Finally, we would like to request the commission to present a thematic report on the situation of human rights of recyclers in Latin America. Thank you. Um, I would like to answer one of the questions regarding the closure of landfills. Currently, because of climate change, we see that landfills are to be closed around the world. But we as recyclers, we request that the closures of the landfills are progressive and that we are considered We want the closure to be progressive and we want a study to assess the situation of recyclers so that we can advance in a progressive manner with the closure of landfills. With regard to intersectionality, it is important to point out that it's important to collect more data because we know that there is a reality, but there is a lack of data produced by the states in terms of this population. There are some data that are produced by recyclers at the local level. We know that according to the University of Panama and the National Movement of Recyclers of Panama, by 2018, 2,000 people depended on informal recycling, and 7% were recyclers over 61 years old. And each of them had four dependents, uh, or four people who depended on them, and 2% were migrants. By 2019, 80% um, of the recyclers were women. And also, we know that the situation changes from one country to the other, but in Peru, most of recyclers are adults or older persons. And regarding the question of girls, boys, and adolescents, we documented that there is a lack of system of care that would benefit recyclers and their children because this group lacks social security. So the safest place for their children to be is with themselves. So children go to work to the landfills with them. In the case of Mexico, there are at least 10,000 people who work as volunteers in the cleaning service of the government. Um, the municipalities and the local governments deny the fact that this work that is being done by these volunteers and recyclers even buy their tools to work and they have no salary and no social security. Through some uh, information requests made by WIO, when these volunteers end up being hired, seven out of 10 contracts are granted for men and not for women. And in Mexico, there is a national pension system for older persons. However, people need to continue working as informal workers and recyclers. We know that we have people who are 70 years old and they have been working for the service of cleaning the streets for 40 years, but they have access to no formal system of social security. Regarding the question on the how sustainable the process is, I would like to talk about some things that are already happening. When the Latin American network talks about recognition, we are talking about this. If recyclers are providing a service, why are they not being paid for it? Uh, if they weren't there, there should be a company that charges a service to collect those uh, that waste. And recyclers are doing this job for corporations that recover bottles and packages in order to mitigate the environmental impact of companies. And this should be compensated. And this has been proved in other states and in other countries, but for that we need the support of the state. 
with regard to the request we have for workers of digital platforms, we would like to have more, uh, we don't have figures regarding how many people or how many workers are working on digital platforms. The platforms change and do not share this information. In Colombia, online platform workers were around 80,000, but when there was a bill that was presented to make this job formal, um, the figures change. So uh, companies have a monopoly on these figures. For example, in Ecuador, 32% of platform workers are from Venezuela and then uh, from Colombia. In Argentina, we see a lot of online platform workers that are from Venezuela. In Colombia, according to a survey conducted by several of our organizations, 98% of workers on online platforms are migrants, especially from Venezuela. And in Uruguay, studies estimate that migrant uh, population accounts for 80% of the uh, workers on online platforms. Migrants are forced to accept informal jobs and they are exposed to irregular and unsafe working conditions because they fear being dismissed and they need to have a livelihood and they have no access to justice. So online platform businesses said that this is a great option for migrants, but in fact, they are exploiting and they are making the most of the irregular situation or the status of migrants to exploit them. In several countries, um, there have been some investigations in Argentina, in Brazil, Chile, um, in order to prohibit some platforms such as Uber, Rappi, etc but none of those investigations has led to an effective sanction. And Miriam now will talk about the barriers that there is when it comes to union freedom. One of the biggest barriers that we have faced- We only have and we, seconds, 12 seconds, 11 seconds. It's the end of the day, please. Bueno. One of the biggest barriers that we have faced or that we face as online platform workers uh, to be unionized is geolocalization. For us, it is very difficult to be together, to be close to each other, because there is not a single place where we can meet or where we can see each other. So uh, we can meet at a place and there are only five people, but they receive a request for to deliver something, so they have to leave. And then two other people came to the meeting, but they have to lay, leave. There is a lot of fluctu fluctuation. And we cannot be at the same place for a long period of time. We're at different cities, uh, in different sectors. So this hampers the possibility of having a union, a union, because we don't have a permanent place where we can meet together. Another barrier has been fear. Workers have fear of belonging to a union because these companies, when they realize that we were trying to have a union, to form a union, that we were going to demand labor rights, we were attacked. Um, there were unjustified retaliation against us. As Mary Laura said before, most of the people who work on digital platforms are migrants and they are highly vulnerable. They don't have the same possibilities as naturals 
in order to access to a formal job. So migrants fear uh, being in a union because of the retaliations businesses um, can promote because um, I'm, I'm sorry. workers I are have mostly- to stop you here. I really am sorry, I have to stop you. We have been online since quarter to eight this morning. So we have to stop uh, um, um, now. In fact, I'm getting calls uh, probably about this. Um, and, and please keep your, your uh, cameras on. Um, the photographer will take a photograph and then I have to close the meeting as soon as he finishes taking the photograph, please. Send us your what you're saying in writing, all of you. It will assist us greatly. And anything else you wish to add, thank you. Just wait for the photographer. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Yo estoy sacando solo un segundito más. Thank you. I'm taking the picture. Just one second. Perfect. Have a nice evening. Thank you. And thank all of you on behalf of the commission, as uh, has been said before, especially by our Commissioner Hernandez, this is really important that you brought this matter to our attention. And it's a matter which has to be considered very avidly, because if you are recognized as workers, there will be consequences attached to that, which will make you put, put you into the tax taxable group of people in, in the country. There are all sorts of things one has to think about. Perhaps when you're sending your written submissions, you could deal with those things as well. If you're formally recognized as workers, what the legal consequences would be vis-a-vis -vis your own responsibility to the state as well, as other workers have presently. All these, you should really, we should, not only you, but we should as well work with you in order to deal with all these things and to assist you technically to collect the data which you need in order to build up and put forward a stronger case. I thank you again on behalf of the commission for this absolutely important and interesting and innovative hearing which we have done today. It's very good of you to have thought of it. Goodbye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.